Well, yes, thanks to Oscar and all the team for this extraordinary event. <laughs> really is extraordinary. And um, <clears throat> what I'm going to talk about is, it's, it's interesting, it's the, uh, we've just heard a talk on the most modern uh, influences of ayahuasca, or in the form of DMT, but I'm going to go as far back as we can in the other direction uh, to, uh, to, to approximately uh, 1,500 BC or <clears throat> three and a half thousand years ago. Um, <clears throat> my interest in this really started about uh, 15 or 16 years ago. Um, I'm primarily a scholar of India, uh, Indian studies, but um, when I started drinking ayahuasca, this was about 16, 17 years ago, I realized that the <clears throat> form of the ritual which I was involved in, which is the Santo Daimi ritual, um, has enormous similarities with Vedic ritual. So I'm just, for the want of a, a, a better description, I'll just give a short introduction to that. So, <clears throat> um, in India, the oldest texts, which are entirely oral texts of that culture, are texts called the Vedas, which means knowledge or, or insight, really. And the Vedas, and in oral form, they date from about 1,500 BC. Similarly, in Iran, we have the Zoroastrian tradition, which goes back to about the same period. In other words, it's, about the late, it's in the late Bronze Age, about 1500 BC, that these texts were first uh, composed. And in both the Zoroastrian tradition and in the Indian, in the Vedic tradition, what is of interest to me is that in these texts we get references to a plant that is both a, a, a deity and a plant. And this is, in India, this is called Soma, and in the Zoroastrian traditions called Homa. It's just a change of a letter due to linguistics. It's the same thing, essentially. And <clears throat> this, this plant has been a mystery to uh, researchers for about 250 years, when Western scholars first started looking in detail at these texts. And they were very puzzled about what this plant could be. It's revered in the highest terms uh, as a teacher, as a doctor, as a medicine, as a, a bringer of insight, wisdom, inspiration, poetic inspiration in particular. And <clears throat> when this uh, research first started about 250 years ago, of course there was no knowledge as we have now of psychedelics or entheogens. And so numerous theories were, were developed about what this plant could be. And <clears throat> there have been a couple of very good summaries of all the theories published. And there are probably 60 or 70 theories about this, what this plant could be. To cut a long story short, within the last 20 or 30 years, there are three main propositions which have emerged as the, 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 as, as for the identity of this plant, or whatever it was. Um, one of the theories is that the plant was ephedra, which is a, a stimulant. It's the basis of amphetamine. Um, it's, a, it's, a, it's a stimulant, it can be very strong if enough of it is taken, but it's not visionary. It, it is purely a stimulant. And <clears throat> this, this uh, plant, ephedra, which grows widely in Asia, is still believed by practically all Zoroastrian scholars as the Holm or Soma plant. And <clears throat> there are some very, very good scholars who support this, this idea. And up until quite recently, ephedra was used in Zoroastrian rituals, uh, which are still continuing, as Vedic ritual still does today, using the ephedra plant. In India, uh, they've known for centuries or even a millennia that they were using substitutes, and all sorts of other non-psychoactive plants were, are used these days in Vedic ritual. But they know it's a substitute. In Iran also, in the Zoroastrian tradition, some people believe it's a substitute for the original Homer, and some people believe um, it's <coughs> the original plant. So that's ephedra, that's one of the theories. Um, another theory that was first proposed right at the beginning of research, in fact in 1784, uh, was that the, that the Soma <coughs> uh, was Ru, Syrian Ru. And we've had a couple of presentations, in fact, one earlier here today by a uh, late morning on, on Syrian root, on Peganum Haramala. And this bush is wide, widespread in, the, in, in Asia. And it um, has obviously many compounds in it, but it is a rich source of harmine and harmaline. 
Um, harmine and harmaline on their own, uh, without uh, additives, uh, are, it's, it is an MA, as you probably know, is an MAOI, and <clears throat> it has been described as um, uh, uh, onerogenic. In other words, it produces a kind of a dream state. <clears throat> It was famously researched in the mid-60s by Claudio Naranjo, who's been here, who wrote a book on this healing journey, including a long section on uh, Syrian rue, on harmine harmaline, and <clears throat> used for, um, he used it in, 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 in psychiatric studies, people accessing dreams and memories and so on. But without uh, the DMT, of course, it is uh, not entheogenic in the, in the true sense of the word. Then, in, uh, famously in 1968, the great uh, Gordon Wasson, the, 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 one of the great founders of uh, the study of mushrooms, um, proposed in a, in a very influential book, Soma, the Divine Mushroom of Immortality, that Soma was the fly agaric Amanita muscaria mushroom. Um, there are still a few scholars that still hold on to the mushroom theory, but um, not many. Um, now, <clears throat> The, uh, coming to the arguments about these different substances, there are essentially two classes of scholars in, involved in all this. Um, one lot of scholars say that the Homa or the Soma was stimulant, but wasn't, vision, vis wasn't a visionary plant, wasn't uh, a vision-inducing plant, and not psychedelic. They don't see any evidence for that. I think if you look carefully in the texts, and there are some very good scholars who have looked at all this, I think it's uh, inevitable, if you know a little bit about uh, psychedelics and entheogens, that what is being described in the, in the Vedas in particular, more than in the Zoroastrian tradition, is something that is psychedelic. The poets of the Veda describe near-death experiences, seeing light, uh, being transported into the clouds, having visions, and so on. And these descriptions are descriptions of their own experience. In Sanskrit, it's atmastuti. They talk about their own experience. So <clears throat> if, the, if, the, uh, if the plant is psychedelic, then what, what are the possible candidates? So the problem with the mushroom theory, the, the Amanita theory, there are two, two main problems with that theory. Um, one, one aspect of it, which has been focused on a lot by people researching this, is that in the Vedas, in the Indian tradition, there, is a lot of, there are quite a lot of descriptions in the Vedas and in the secondary literature, or the subsidiary literature rather, of how this plant is prepared. And it's prepared through the, 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 the plant is, comes in stalks, in twigs or stalks. It's pounded with stones and the juice is extracted. And if you've ever seen the uh, carpi vine, uh, prepared, it's prepared in exactly the same manner. In other words, it's the pounding of these vines and the extraction of the juice, which is the important point. And of course, with mushrooms, you don't need to pound the mushrooms to get the juice out. You just eat the mushrooms, as they do in Siberia. Um, that's one objection. A second objection to that, the, the mushroom idea is that in the, uh, in the Indian tradition, amongst the Brahmins, in, in texts that govern uh, their, 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 their customs, if you like, the Dharma Sutras, these texts called Dharma Sutras, um, they're ex explicitly against mushrooms. They say you should, there are some things you shouldn't, a Brahmin shouldn't take. This is the high caste uh, of Indians. You shouldn't, you, shouldn't eat mush you shouldn't eat garlic, onions, or mushrooms. They're dead against mushrooms. <laughs> and there are a couple of re references to mushrooms in the Veda, but it's negative. So you've got the, the, the two, two objections to mushrooms. One is that it's not pound, the, 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 things are, the, the, the stuff is pounded with stones to get the juice out, and also the prohibition against mushrooms. So if the, if the um, drink that they were taking was psychedelic, what could it possibly be? Well, by this time, if there was a single plant that was psychedelic in Asia, and very powerfully entheogenic or psychedelic, I'm absolutely certain it would have been discovered by now. People are looking at all sorts of uh, plants for all sorts of effects, and nothing's been discovered that is remotely uh, similar to this. So about 15 years ago, I realized that uh, there's only one possible solution to this, is that, in fact, it wasn't one plant. It was a combination of plants. Now, if this soma is looked at as a combination of plants, it solves many mysteries. 
Um, one thing that's puzzled scholars is that in the Avesta, that's the Zoroastrian sacred texts, uh, that what are described are many homers. In other words, many types of this. Homers of the mountains, homers of the plains, and so on. Um, interestingly also, <coughs> um, the, uh, yeah, so there is many, many homers. <coughs> and my hypothesis is that uh, in the late Bronze Age, which there was a very sophisticated culture in many examples in city-states throughout Asia, in Mesopotamia, in Greece, and in the Indus Valley. Very advanced knowledge of shipbuilding, crops, town planning, ta organization, and so on. And they also famously, in some cases, particularly in the Greek case, had a very, very extensive knowledge of plants. In the last 20 years, 20 years or so, um, up until 93, in Jonathan Ott's Pharmacothian, he, in that book, he, he identified 60 plants with uh, MAOI and 70 plants with DMT. And these are dispersed uh, globally. With sufficient botanical knowledge, in fact, you can make ayahuasca analogues just about anywhere if you know enough about plants. It's a question of finding a, MA, a source of MAOI and a source of DMT. So... <clears throat> I don't believe, the other thing is that soma or homa uh, comes from a root su or hu. It's the same root, it's just a linguistic difference. And that means something that's pressed. And scholars have pointed out that in fact, soma doesn't really refer to a plant, it re refers to a pressed preparation. And that my hypothesis is that it was a, a preparation of, of two plants, and possibly more admixtures to this. Um, the, there was a, a very extensive study on um, Homer done by two scholars, Flattery and Schwartz. It's been referred to also by a couple of people at this conference, who suggested the, the Syrian rue, which I mentioned earlier. But um, I think they only got halfway there. I think there was another uh, plant that was added that produced the entheogenic concoction. Um, interestingly, uh, also if we look in the, in the Vedas, or specifically in the Brahmanas, which are texts which are subsidiary to the Veda, it's what a lot of scholars have not noticed is that the Soma or Homa is a purgative. Even the great god Indra, who's one of the great Vedic gods, he throws up after drinking, uh, <laughs> drinking Soma. <laughs> And so when we're looking at all this information, it, it looks so similar to ayahuasca, it's, it's amazing. Um, the other thing is that, the, that what is described in uh, the, the text is that the, this soma or homa is a bitter, brownish, reddish, yellowish liquid. During the rituals, it's drunk approximately every three hours, and there are very formal uh, ceremonies for the drinking of this of this um, concoction. And so <clears throat> it seems to me that the evidence conclusively points to the Soma or Homa not being one plant, but a combination of plants, as in South America in the upper Amazon. And I've also been looking at the uh, references in the Brahmanas, these texts, that, to plants that are called substitutes for Soma. And the there are six plants that, I, that are specifically mentioned, and um, one, one of the classes of plants are all relative, they, it's called kush grass or darba grass, and this is a relative of phalaris grass, and phalaris grass, as is probably most of you know, is also a source of DMT. The other plants that I've been interested in are five trees. Four of them are, are species of fig, ficus species, and these plants, um, as far I've been looking extensively for the last year, have, have never been tested for MAOI. And the hypothesis is that uh, it was these species of fig tree and an another tree, which is the flame of the forest, which was the, the, the source for the substitute plants that they were producing the soma from. So I, 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 in fact, I've just uh, made some interesting connections at this conference here to... Uh, further this study and I hope within a few months to have positive proof that this was how the Soma Homer preparation was made in the ancient world. Thank you. Thank you.